the last couple of months, we've mainly been concerned with the more theoretical parts of the course, proving theorems like Cauchy's theorem and Cauchy's formula, and leading up to the residue theorem. Today I'm going to be dealing not with the theory, but with techniques. And I'm going to spend this program actually evaluating some integrals. The first is one you've already met in the last radio program. It was our semicircle example. In this example, I want to integrate the function e to the i z over z squared plus 1 around this semicircle, which consists of part of the real axis from minus r to r, together with this semicircular bit in the upper half plane. And I'm going to assume that r is greater than 1. Well, how did we do this one? We used the residue theorem. The integral of a function around a contour gamma is just 2 pi i times the sum of all the residues at the poles alpha j lying inside the contour. So we can evaluate the integral just by calculating residues. Well, let's see how this works with our particular example. So the first thing is to find out where the poles are. Well, we don't get any poles from the numerator. We only get poles when the denominator is 0. In other words, at plus i and at minus i. But minus i lies outside the contour, so we can ignore it. So we only need to look at the pole at i, and this lies inside the contour because r is greater than 1. So applying the residue theorem, we have that this integral is equal to 2 pi i times the residue at i. And if you work out this residue, you find it comes to just e to the minus 1 over 2i. So multiplying by 2 pi i, we get the answer, which is pi over e. And as you can see, it doesn't depend on the radius r as long as r is greater than 1. Well, I haven't given the full details here because I went through those in the radio program. But what I want to do with this integral now is something new. I want to break it up into two bits, the integral along the real axis and the integral around the semicircular bit. And what we're going to find is that the integral around the semicircular bit has limit 0 as we let the radius get large. In other words, if we let the radius get large, then the integral around the whole contour and the integral along the real axis become as close together as we like. Well, how are we going to prove that? We want to show that this integral here, round the semicircular bit, gets very small when r becomes large. And we prove this by using the estimation theorem. If you remember what that says, it says that the modulus of this integral is less than or equal to ml, where l is the length of the contour, and m is an upper bound for the modulus of this function. Well, l is easy enough to work out. That's obviously pi r. So how do we find an upper bound for the modulus of this function? Well, to do that, all we need to do is to find an upper bound for the modulus of the numerator and a lower bound for the modulus of the denominator. So let's start off with the numerator. And we can write the modulus of e to the i z is just the modulus of e to the i. Well, z is just x plus i y. And we can split this into two bits. We've got the modulus of e to the i x times the modulus of e to the i squared y. That's just e to the minus y. But we know that the modulus of this is equal to 1. And we also know that the modulus of this is less than or equal to 1 because y is positive. This is, in fact, why we chose a semicircle in the upper half plane. 
So combining these, we get less than or equal to 1. So the modulus of the numerator is less than or equal to 1. And we now need to find a lower bound for the modulus of the denominator. And we do this by using a form of the triangle inequality. Mod of z squared plus 1 is greater than or equal to mod of z squared minus 1. And this is just equal to r squared minus 1. So combining all these results, we can get an upper bound for this. It's just the length, which is pi r, times the upper bound for the modulus of this, which we've seen is 1 over r squared minus 1. And this expression here obviously has limit 0 as r becomes large. So what have we done? We've shown that the integral around the semicircular bit has limit 0 as the radius becomes large. And we also know that the value of the whole integral around the whole contour is just pi over e. So we've got pi over e is equal to the integral around the semicircle of this expression. And we break it up into these two bits here. You notice that in this one, I've written t rather than z because we're integrating along the real axis. And we've just shown that this integral here around the semicircular bit has limit 0 if we let r become large. So if we let r become large, we can write that pi over e is the limit as r becomes large of the integral from minus r to r of this expression, e to the i t over t squared plus 1 dt. And we usually write this complicated expression in the simpler form minus infinity to infinity of the same thing. So the integral of this complex valued function here is just pi over e. But there's one more thing we can do with this, because we know that e to the i t is just cos plus i sine. So we can split this equation into real and imaginary parts. So let's do this. If we take the real part, we get the integral from minus infinity to infinity of cos t over t squared plus 1. That's just the real part of this, which is obviously pi over e. And we can do the same sort of thing for the imaginary part. We just get the integral from minus infinity to infinity of sine t, that's the imaginary part of that, over the same thing is the imaginary part of this, which is obviously 0. So starting with one contour integral, we've evaluated two real integrals. Let's just quickly recap on all that, and we'll also show you how it works in general. We started by wanting to evaluate this contour integral. And more generally, we can integrate various other functions of this kind round a semicircle. We usually take f to be a rational function. To evaluate our integral, we used the residue theorem, giving the answer pi over e. And in general, we just work out 2 pi i times the sum of the residues inside the contour. Then we used the estimation theorem to show that the integral around the curved bit has limit 0 as the radius gets large. And this happens in general as well. So we get the integral of the complex valued function to be pi over e as well. And a similar thing happens in general. And finally, we take real parts to deduce the value of this real integral. And in the general case, 
This real integral is just the real part of the, con of the contour integral we started with. So by starting with complex integrals, we can work out certain types of real integrals. But in practice, the whole procedure usually works the other way around. Usually we're given the real integral to evaluate, and we do it by evaluating the corresponding complex integral. But there's one problem which can arise. What happens if the function we want to integrate has a singularity on the real axis? Well, to show you what we mean, I've got an example here. Instead of looking at the integral of cos t over t squared plus 1, which we worked out before, supposing we put an extra term in, t minus 2, in the denominator. And the first thing we've got to do is to, is to work out what this means. It's now an improper integral because the function isn't defined at the point 2, and 2 lies within the range of integration. Well, to work out what it means, you may remember the definition from the text, that if f is undefined at the point c, then we integrate up to c minus epsilon, and then from c plus epsilon onwards, and take the limit as epsilon approaches 0 through positive values. So the meaning of this is as follows. We just take the integral from minus infinity to infinity. We know that that is the limit as r tends to infinity of minus r to r. And then we can write this as the limit as r becomes large of, well, it's the integral from minus r to 2 minus epsilon plus the integral from 2 plus epsilon to r. And then we take the limit as if epsilon tends to 0 through positive values. So now we know what this integral means, how are we going to evaluate it? Well, the natural thing is to try and use a semicircle. Well, if we try and do that, we get a picture like this. 2 is a pole, and we can't draw this line because 2 would then lie on the contour. So how are we going to get round 2? We have to take a byte out of the contour, like that. So now we have to integrate round the outside, along the two bits of the real axis, and round the byte. And it turns out that as epsilon becomes small, the integral around the byte is easy to calculate. It's just minus pi i times the residue at the point 2. Well, intuitively, this is because supposing we were integrating right the way around 2, then it would be 2 pi i times the residue, whereas we are just going backwards halfway round, so it's minus pi i times the residue. So all, all we have to do now is to let r become very large so that the two bits of the real axis tend to the whole real line, and we can carry on as before. Well, both of these examples, we've used semicircles. But sometimes when we're doing contour integration, we, we need to use other forms of contours. And in my next example, I want to use a parallelogram. I should warn you that this example is rather more difficult than the sort that we'd be likely to give you. So don't worry too much about the details. The important thing you should get out of this example is the basic method we use. And it's much the same as what we had before. Well, here's my problem right here. It's an integral which turns up in statistics quite a bit and in various other applications. And what I want to do is to show that the integral of e to the minus x squared is equal to root pi. Well, to simplify things later on, I'm going to make a slight substitution. I'm going to replace x by t times root 2 pi, as a linear change of variable. And what this gives is that I've got to prove that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus 2 pi t squared dt is equal to 1 over root 2. That's what I've got to prove. So to prove this, I'm going to 
use the method I've used before, I'm going to integrate a suitable function round a parallelogram. And the next question is, what function do I use? Well, I'm going to use this rather unwieldy looking function here. Obviously, we wouldn't expect you to think this up for yourself. I certainly didn't. But the important thing is, it works, and the basic ideas that we're going to use are the ones that you're already familiar with. Well, before worrying about exactly what parallelogram I'm going to use, let's follow the earlier method and use the residue theorem. So our first job is to find out where the poles are. Well, do we get any poles from the numerator? Z squared is obviously analytic everywhere, and so is the exponential. And so composing them, the numerator is analytic everywhere. So we don't get any poles from there. How about the denominator? Well, we get poles whenever sine pi z is equal to 0. And that happens when z is equal to 0, or plus or minus 1, or plus or minus 2, or any other integer. And as you should know by now, these are all simple poles. So these are the only poles of this function. Well, how about the residues at all these poles? Well, it would be, si be silly if I went and calculated them all now, because I don't know which ones are going to lie inside the parallelogram. In fact, quite often, students tend to calculate every residue in sight, and then find that they don't need half of them. So the next thing we've got to do is to look at, the, at exactly what parallelogram we're going to use and find out which poles lie inside it. Well, my parallelogram is going to look like this. Two of the sides will be horizontal, and the other two will be at an angle of 45 degrees. And we're going to position the parallelogram like this. The two diagonal sides will pass through the points a half and minus a half. So that the only pole which lies inside the contour is the pole at zero. So now we've only got one residue to work out. And by our standard rules for working out residues at simple poles, it's easy to check that the residue at zero is equal to 1 over pi. So by the residue theorem, we get the integral round this parallelogram is equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues. There's only this one residue. And multiplying these together, we get 2i. So 2i is the value of the integral taken around the parallelogram. And we've now got to relate this to the problem that we're trying to solve. And to do this, we split up the parallelogram into its four sides. So if this is the parallelogram here, a, b, c, d, we're going to integrate around there. We know that 2i is equal to the integral round this parallelogram, and we break it up into the four bits AB, BC, CD, and DA. Now, it turns out that as the parallelogram gets longer and longer, so that as this height becomes larger and larger, then the integrals along the top and the bottom have limit 0. So we can ignore them. We've proved this in detail in the broadcast notes, so you can check that there. So we've only got to worry about the integrals along AB and along CD, the two diagonal sides. And we do these by parametrization. Let's look at AB first. The line AB can be parametrized in this way by Z equals a half plus 1 plus I times T as t goes from minus r to r. So we just have to substitute that in. Well, as you can imagine, the details of this are a bit complicated, 
So to save time, I've written them out in advance. And this is what we get. Here's the integral along AB of the function we're dealing with. And we parameterize by z is equal to a half plus 1 plus i times t, as t goes from minus r to plus r. If we do that and simplify, there's quite a lot of simplification that goes on, and we end up with this mess here. There's a root 2 i on the outside, the integral from minus r to r, the whole lot of garbage here, times e to the minus 2 pi t squared, which is what we're really interested in. So that looks hopeful, even if that looks a bit of a mess. Well, now let's look at the one along CD. And we can go through exactly the same process. The integral along CD of this function, we can parameterize it in the same sort of way, and we can carry out the same sort of calculations. And what we end up with is root 2i, as before, the integral times a lot more garbage, times, again, what we're interested in. Well, how are we going to salvage these e to the minus 2 pi t squares and get rid of the others? Well, we do that by adding. We want to know the integral along a, b, plus the integral along c, d. So let's add these together and see what we get. Well, we get a root, a root 2 i times the integral from minus r to r. We'll worry about all this bit in a minute although there's certainly a cos pi 1 plus i times t on the bottom. And we've got the e to the minus 2 pi t squared dt common to both integrals. So the question is, what goes on top? Well, here we have e to the, e to the i times something and here we've got e to the minus i times something. Well, when we have e to the i something plus e to the minus i times something, and we add them, we get twice the cos. So we get 2 cos pi times 1 plus i t. Well, the details don't matter, but what's important is that these look rather similar. Lo and behold, they cancel. And all we're left here is just the 2. What to do now is to let r become large, and we go back to what we had before. We have that 2i is equal to the sum of these integrals. We've just worked out that this sum is 2 root 2i times the integral from minus infinity to infinity now, because we've let r become large, e to the minus 2 pi t squared dt. This is what we want to find. So we just cancel out the 2i, and we get the integral from minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus 2 pi t squared dt. That's what we want to find. This is just 1 over root 2, which is the answer we were trying to get. Well, as I said before, that was rather a hard example. Actually, it was only the details which were complicated. The basic method was the same as before. We used the residue theorem, and then we split up the integral into its component bits. So now you know what to do. You can go away and ev evaluate lots more integrals on your own.